do you favor or oppose metropolitan planning organizations for communities under 200,000 in population? Why or why not? Uh, what is a metropolitan a planning organization? I think our county commissioner would be best to explain exactly what that is. <laughs> sat on the Lehigh Valley Strategic Advisory uh, Planning Board where we did look at uh, ways to be able to spend federal money and it was a diverse group of people uh, to be able to come to the best conclusion. Um, obviously, there would be competing interests, uh, suburban, urban, rural, business and nonprofit, uh, and various demographics uh, in terms of what they're looking to do for federal money coming into the area. But I think that's probably the best way to get to the right solution. You know, some of those can be very cantankerous meetings. as people jockey for position and, and talk about the value of specific projects. But especially, I think, for smaller communities, it's extremely important. And it would be a way to ensure that federal money is spent most efficiently. Um, who else knows how it should be spent and people at the local level and what better way to get to the best solution and have an open discussion with people. So I think it's an excellent idea, especially for smaller communities, maybe even more so than for larger communities. Larger communities have more staff, more expertise to be able to apply for grants, compete nationally, and analyze situations. Smaller communities do not. Using your own homegrown talent is the best way to accomplish good results. Thank you. Rick, you'll start us off in this next one. We're going to turn to foreign affairs, um, focusing primarily on the Middle East. Uh, do you support continuing to withdraw our troops and uh, maybe all of our troops? I know there's going to be some hanging around for a couple more years. And what are your thoughts on Syria and our future possible aggressions with Iran? I do believe that we should do a strategic withdrawal from Afghanistan. Our military has been exceptionally successful both in Iraq and Afghanistan, but it may no longer be a military problem. It may be another problem that needs to be taken care of in other ways, which could include foreign aid and NPOs, especially in Afghanistan. It's a horrible situation there. Uh, going forward as we are now, or pulling out, will not be positive for thousands of people. Pulling out, I want to ensure that any Afghanistan person who has worked with us comes back with us. We cannot leave our soldiers or sailors behind it. We can also not leave our allies and friends over there behind. They need to have the option to come here to be resettled. Syria, I think we've handled that well. Um, and I believe that the regime will fall on its own accord. And in terms of Iran and nuclear weapons, I also believe that the president has handled that well. The sanctions will work. Uh, Iran does uh, spout quite a bit of rhetoric. They are very dangerous. But uh, historically, they have been able to act in a rational manner beyond what their rhetoric says. And of course, we need to be able to stay with Israel. Israel is our number one ally. Israel is the only democracy in the Middle East, and uh, support for Israel should not waver. Jackson? Ten years after 9-11, the question is not, why did we go to Afghanistan? The question is, why are we still there? The answer, we are told, 
is that if we left, the Taliban would come back, and if the Taliban came back, Al-Qaeda would come back, and if Al-Qaeda came back, the U.S. would again be attacked. All of that is wrong. If we left, the Taliban would take over more territory, but they are a hated group in Afghanistan and would not retake the country. Even if they did retake the country, they wouldn't invite Al-Qaeda back. From their point of view, that was the number one mistake they made last time. And even if Al-Qaeda did come back, this is not the United States of before 9-11 that is afraid to intervene in other countries to protect its national interests. I don't see why we are still there spending $2 billion a week when we need to rebuild this country back here at home. Uh, with regard to Iran, I believe that uh, we must uh, ensure that Iran does not develop a nuclear weapon. Uh, we need to keep all military options on the table. I do believe that uh, sanctions will work, uh, but uh, the development of a nuclear weapon in Iran is not only a threat to our ally, Israel, but it's also against the strategic interests of the United States in that region. Uh, the proliferation of nuclear weapons in that region of the world uh, is exceedingly dangerous. It could set off a nuclear arms race with other countries like Saudi Arabia. Uh, and uh, the fact that Iran has ties to terrorist organizations like Hamas and Hezbollah uh, is yet another reason to ensure uh, that this does not happen. Thank you, gentlemen. We're going to come back home with a question on education. Jackson, you can start us off. Uh, one of the big accomplishments of the Bush administration was the No Child Left Behind uh, Act. And I think it's safe to say it's kind of falling apart these days. The current administration is giving exemptions to states across the country so that they don't, they don't have to meet the standardized test scores. What are your thoughts on this legislation? Do we continue to get rid of it, what are your thoughts on your plan for education in the future of America? Well, you are, you are right, the uh, uh, NCLP has, uh, as you put it, uh, fallen apart. It is yet another case of Congress that's been unable to come together uh, on a piece uh, of legislation. Uh, NCLB has some uh, laudatory goals, uh, but the way uh, it goes about doing it uh, is, uh, has been proven to be unworkable. We can see how many schools uh, have been rated as failing schools under the Act, uh, and how many have needed waivers from the government. I think what we need to concentrate on in education in this country uh, is to make sure that we are getting great teachers in the classroom. Uh, if you look at other countries, and so let's take a step back and just look at where the U.S. is in education. Right now, uh, we are not doing uh, as well as we need to be. We're, we are at best average uh, and unfortunately often below average in international reading, uh, math, science proficiency tests. If you look at those countries that are performing well, uh, countries uh, uh, like uh, in, in Scandinavia, and you look at how they uh, treat their teachers, uh, teaching in those countries is one of the top three professions uh, that students aspire to. Uh, it's something that's encouraged uh, teachers are paid at the same graduate level of education that those in similar positions uh, in those countries are. We need to make sure that we are building up uh, that profession here in the United States. Uh, I, have, uh, I have two brothers, one works uh, uh, in, uh, in finance and one works as a teacher, and you can imagine uh, which one is paid more. Uh, and yet we as a society expect uh, our uh, teachers to be the very best. We expect our children to have the very best teachers in education. We need to make sure that we match that uh, with what we do. Thank you. Rick? Okay, my first concern for students would be uh, those with learning disabilities. The federal government does uh, provide funding for special education needs. The vast majority of dropouts are students who have learning disabilities. There is a tremendous explosion of technology that can help students uh, in all shapes and forms to learn better. It's, it's an incredible new tool that we've been given. And the federal government should be using block grants at the local level, where the local level has control 
or how it is spent, but to use and to experiment with new forms of technology for students with learning disabilities. The model of 30 kids in a class with a chalkboard behind them, kind of like where we're sitting now, doesn't fit for all children. And because of technology, we have the ability to instruct kids in ways that they can actually learn better than they ever have before. And that's a number one priority for them. It's a new area, and we need to get on that quickly, because my first concern is to prevent the number of kids that are dropping out, because my concern overall is that people who are struggling, whether it's children or, or people that have low skills, you know, they're not college educators, you're not an attorney, those are the people that are at risk for becoming a permanent underclass in this country. And at the federal level, that should be our first priority to provide assistance. Second, I will never vote for anything that is a backdoor to union busting. There's a lot of things that are touted as helping education when the real focus of it is just to get rid of our teachers' unions. I support our teachers' unions. They need to be there. They need to be strong. Thank you. Another hot topic to do, I think, primarily to the presidential election is women's health. Um, what are your thoughts on, on this issue? Are you in favor of the continuing of taking away money from plan, place, things like Planned Parenthood as like, states such as Texas is doing currently? And what is your thoughts on the supply of contraception and services to low-income patients? I support funding for Planned Parenthood. Planned Parenthood provides outstanding medical care for many women who wouldn't otherwise have access to it. I support contraception. Life and contraception obviously is a way to prevent pregnancies. Similar to what Senator Casey believes on that subject, I oppose the blood amendment and I oppose any humiliating procedure uh, such as what's been proposed in Harrisburg uh, on women. But women's health and contraception should be fully funded throughout the country and especially for poor women. Jackson? Uh, I am in favor of a, a woman's right to choose, uh, and I believe that this assault uh, on women's health, uh, on women's access to contraception, uh, is, is striking. Uh, this is something that we thought was settled a generation ago. You look at the problems that we're facing in this country, you look at the jobs crisis, you look at the debt crisis, all these other issues, uh, education, uh, uh, immigration, energy, the environment, uh, I cannot understand why the Republican Party uh, is trying to revisit an issue uh, that was settled uh, uh, 20 or more years ago. Women should have access to birth control. I support the President's accommodation uh, with the Catholic uh, 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 affiliated hospitals and universities that would allow women uh, uh, to have access uh, through uh, their insurance companies. Unfortunately, our congressman, Charlie Dent, has indicated a willingness uh, 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 to support John Boehner's attempt to repeal that accommodation. And I think he needs to be called on it. Uh, Charlie Dent has indicated a, a willingness to uh, eliminate access to abortion services on national health exchanges. That, that's what happened when he voted for the Stupak Amendment. We need to call him on it. And we are not going to be able to call him on it unless we have a pro-choice candidate running in November. Thank you. And I have a quick, quick last question for you. I just want a quick answer. It doesn't be very long. We're going to go into closing statements because unfortunately our hour is closing to an end here. Um, if you were elected uh, congressman, I'm sure you have an issue that's near and dear to you. What would be your first piece of legislation? What is that issue that it'll be, Jackson? I would introduce on day one legislation, a, a jobs bill that would invest fifty billion dollars rebuilding our infrastructure here in the 15th district, rebuilding our roads, rebuilding our bridges, rebuilding our infrastructure, and putting Pennsylvanians back to work, day one. My first priority would be to reform and strengthen Medicare, especially the Affordable Health Care Act. It is found to be unconstitutional. It's a program that works well. 
It's a program that meets a critical need. I see it every day at the senior center, and it will be my top priority the first day of Congress. Thank you for your answers. And since Ricky started off with the introductions, Jackson, you can start us off in the closing statement. Two minutes, thanks. Well, thank you again, and thank everyone again uh, for your, your attention tonight. When I was in U.S. Army Ranger School at Fort Benning, Georgia, every day, every Ranger stood in formation together and recited together the Ranger Creed. Six lines about what it meant to be a U.S. Army Ranger. And as one general said, the most famous line of that creed was, never shall I leave a fallen comrade. Every Ranger together saying that, never shall I leave a fallen comrade. And that wasn't a slogan, that wasn't a mindless mantra, that was a promise. That was a promise that every Ranger knew that his buddy would be there for him on the battlefield and that he would not be left behind. Can our Congress say the same thing? Our Congress has left too many people behind. Too many people looking for work. Too many people wondering if Social Security and Medicare will be there for them in their retirement. Too many women wondering if they will lose their right to choose. I am the only candidate who has a day one jobs bill to invest $50 billion in our infrastructure to put Pennsylvanians back to work. With a day one bill to ensure that Medicare and Social Security remain solvent, the Simpson Bowles Commission reforms. And I am the only candidate who is 100% pro choice. And because of that, I am the only candidate that can beat Congressman Dent this fall. Thank you all very much. Okay. And also, uh, thank you to everybody who put this forum in place. Uh, it was excellent. I really appreciate uh, being here. My background is in social work, and I've worked with uh, children in foster care, I worked at the shelter for women's families, and now I work at the Lehigh County Senior Center. In my heart, as a Democrat, my focus has always been looking to help those in need. I believe as a government of the people, by the people, and for the people, we particularly have to make sure that the most vulnerable in our society the elderly, working families, have a fair chance and are cared for. And that will be my focus in Congress, and we look to serve the people. Thank you. Let's give a quick round of applause to Jackson and Rick for the exercise. And we're going to have a couple quick more announcements here from Farnham. And again, thank you everyone for attending this evening.